Do you know what matters most to God? What's most important to him? As we're going through this series on discipleship and trying to learn how to become, how to make disciples like Jesus made disciples, uh, we're in Mark chapter 12 and we're right in the middle of Holy Week. It's Wednesday. In fact, we're going to be on Wednesday for a couple more sermons, okay, just letting you know. But we're in the middle of Wednesday, and on Wednesday, again, the Pharisees and the Sadducees have been coming to Jesus. They've been trying to trap Jesus. We had that crazy question from last, last week where the Sadducees, who don't believe in the resurrection, now that, that should set you off right there, ask Jesus a resurrection question. Okay. They don't believe in the resurrection. They don't believe in the supernatural power of God, and yet they come to Jesus. And they say, Jesus, we have this question. It's a very serious question. So this woman marries a man. Jesus is with them. But the man dies before they have any children. Now, as you know, Jesus, the law, like Jesus needs a lecture on the law. Okay, Yes, you know, Jesus, the, le- the law says that if a man dies without having had an heir, his brother is supposed to marry the, the wife. And by the way, there's some other instructions about that, but you can look that up in Exodus on your own. But, but Jesus says... Uh, and, and, then, and so they say, so the, the man dies, and her brother, his brother, marries the lady. Only problem is, he dies and doesn't have any children. And then the third brother, he follows through, and he marries the lady, and he dies. And then the fourth brother, he marries the lady, and he dies. And the fifth brother, he marries the lady, and he dies. And the sixth brother, and the seventh brother, and finally the lady dies. And somebody was saying, like, yes, finally she's out. <laughs> I mean, she's taken out seven da- husbands, right? <laughs> and then they have the question. So in the resurrection, whose who's wife is she? <laughs> okay, these guys don't believe in the resurrection. Okay, it's a stupid hypothetical question. And Jesus will deal with that. No, you don't understand. And he takes them back and he ta- teaches them about resurrection when he teaches them that, that, that Moses is introduced to the God who is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God I am. And there's this lawyer that's been watching this and listening. And as he's been watching and listening, he says, you know Jesus really gave a pretty good answer to those guys. Now, he's not a Sadducee, so he's kind of glad that they got set in their place. But he's been listening to the fact that the, the Pharisees, as well as the Sadducees, have been trying to trap Jesus. And he's listening to this, and he says, man, that's a really good answer. I think Jesus has a hook. <laughs> and he's starting to draw all this man in. And so he says, um, Jesus, I, I have a question I want to ask you. In fact, let's, let's look at Mark 12 and, and see the question uh, in verses 28 to 34. <coughs> One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any other questions. What's the most important of all the commandments? 
Now, you have to understand that the lawyers, the, the religious leaders said that there were 613 separate laws. How did they come up with that? Well, they looked at the, at the Ten Commandments and they said there's 613 letters that make up the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. Therefore, there have to be 613 laws. Those laws are divided into two parts. There's 248 affirmative laws, positive laws. How'd they come up with that? Well, because they said there's 248 parts to your body, so they had to have 248 affirmative laws. And there were 365 negative laws. Well, that's one for every day of the year. How'd they come up with us? Who knows? But, but based on the fact that there were 613 letters that made up the Ten Commandments, therefore, they came up with all these different laws. There were light laws and hard laws. Semi, and the light laws, well, they're kind of like sort of semi-optional. But the heavy laws, oh no, those, those, you had to do those. How close are you un to understanding what really, really matters to God? According to Jesus, this teacher of the law is very close to comprehending what matters to God. Jesus actually says, you know, you... You are this close to the kingdom of God. How many of you know our mission statement? Kind of quiet in here. <laughs> our, our mission statement is at the top of our worship bulletin. It's, it's there every week for those of us who forget what it is. <laughs> and it says that we are putting legs to faith. Loving God, encouraging one another, growing as Christ's disciples, and sharing Christ. And the first part of that is what we, take. every year when we go through the mission statement, we start out by first off saying, what does it mean to have this responsibility? The first and most important commandment is to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. In fact, Jesus puts those two together as one. This is what really matters to God. This is our mission. We have a responsibility as the body of Christ to love God and love our neighbor. And they go hand in hand. There's the, the vertical uh, relationship with God. We love God. Worship is about loving God, isn't it? Here's the challenge. is too often worship is not about loving God. It's about what we can get for us. How many people say, well, I'm going to look for a different church because I'm not being fed. Now, wait a second. Was worship about being fed? No, no, no. I think worship is about God, right? It's about loving him. It's about adoring him. Now, I understand also uh, a great book that I read years ago is uh, Why Men Hate Going to Church. <laughs> Some of us may have felt uncomfortable. You are beautiful. God, you are beautiful. Now, we say that to a bride, right, guys? But we don't often really say it to, a, to, a, to God, right? <laughs> or, or to another guy, right? And so there's some kind of discomfort sometimes that guys feel with even a phrase like that. Now, please, if you didn't think about that, forget what I just said. Okay. <laughs> if it didn't bother you, ignore it. But my, my point is this, is this, is that worship is about us and our love for God, our enjoying Him, our, our coming into His presence. It's, it's a, yes, should worship refresh you? By all means. When you've been in the presence of God, shouldn't you go away refreshed? Shouldn't you go away blessed by that? But are you blessed because you got fed? Or are you blessed because you gave your attention to God? And our challenge is, is that sometimes we're not really coming to worship. We're just at worship. Sometimes we're not here to really say, God. I need to recognize and understand why wow, you're so much bigger and greater than I comprehend. Or sometimes we need to come with a worship like David did when he was coming into Jerusalem and he was bringing back the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. And he celebrated it so much that he started dancing and singing and hands raised. He got charismatic in his 
wife got nervous. <laughs> Some of us need to have that kind of excitement for God. And maybe that's one of the reasons why Jesus said we need to become like little children. How close are you to understanding what, what really matters to God? Okay. Jesus, in responding, responds with the Shema, the Shema Israel. If you've heard that phrase before, I'm sure. Shema means what? Means to hear. It's the first word of the, the Shema Israel. Hear, O Israel. In fact, from Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Hear, O Israel. Shema Israel. The Lord is one. And Jesus put right on the heart, on the <coughs> following after that, Leviticus 19, 18, and do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Alan Carr said, Jesus responds to this man's question by first quoting the Shema. The Shema, you might remember, was also written on small strips of paper or parchment, placed in leather boxes, which they called phylacteries. They'd put them on their wrist and wear them there or on their forehead. And then they're carrying this, this promise, this blessing with them. They also wrote it on doorposts. And, 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 and some of you might have seen them if you've been to Israel. They're, they're actually in hotel rooms and, all, and doors of hotel rooms all over the place. They're called the mezuzah. And, and these, again, are the, the, the Shema Israel and the promises of God that are written right there so that people remember wherever they're at, whatever they're doing, God is with them. So if they're going out into the streets, God is there. As they're walking out to work, God is there. As they're coming into their home, God is there. And it's a reminder of the blessings of God. Shema Israel, behold, your God is one God. Bob... Um, Roglian says, one of the pitfalls of technology, one of the pitfall falls of technology and worship is losing sight of the fact that worship is first and foremost a human experience with God. That's not our worship. And it can assist us or it can be a distraction, can't it? The technology that we use in worship can be helpful to us or it can become our focus. He goes on, he says, think instead of those fleeting moments, whether it was in a high-tech house of worship or all alone in the privacy of your personal prayer closet, when it all clicks, when every outside distraction and thought of self slips away and you are pouring your whole self out to God. You bow your whole body in a posture of stunned reverence. Your mind reels with truths too huge to contain. Your soul explodes with unbounded passion for the God of your salvation. And your heart bursts with a longing to follow Jesus and to do his will. This is worship. This is what we were made for. Let's try to understand what Jesus was saying when he said you were supposed to love God with our whole heart mind, soul, and strength. In, in biblical anthropology, the heart is the seat of the will. It's the, the volitional aspect of who we are. In, in other words, to love God with our heart is to choose worship as a deliberate act. We're designed to worship God. It's something that, that we do voluntarily though it's something that we we choose to do and we make deliberate choices to bring god glory i, I guess the thing i was wondering about as i was doing this is thinking well what are we choosing to worship i'm, I'm sure most of you in this room would say i worship god right really what do your action, actions say that you choose to worship 
How many of you have been watching the Olympics this week? How many have not, just so I know? Oh, I'm sorry. No. <laughs> so for those of you who've watched the Olympics, you can just kind of sit there and like, okay, that was interesting. Somebody's running to the finish line, swimming to the finish line, diving to the finish line, scoring in the goal or whatever, uh, riding their bicycle. And you just kind of say, yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> another one finished and another one won. Or do you get just a little bit, yeah, go, yeah, yeah. No, do, 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 just be honest, okay? How many of you got excited sometime during watching the Olympics, if you were watching? Okay. Virgil did. <laughs> Thank you, Jan, for confessing his sin. Appreciate that. <laughs> what are we choosing to worship? Because that which we're giving our most time to, our most energy, our most passion to, that which we're, we're choosing to, to give our attention to, our focus, our energy, our time, that's what we really worship. Jesus goes on, he says, to love God with our, our whole soul. The soul is that, that deep feeling place inside of each of us. Now, now notice you might say, oh no, I thought the soul was the nephesh. It's, the, it's the, the part that's gonna go to heaven. No, right now he's talking about that, the emotional place inside of each one of us where we express feelings. Over and over again, the psalmist used the word soul to localize their intensely emotional expressions of worship. You see, we are designed to be emotional and to worship God emotionally. That's why the worship team's always told, what? Smile, right? Look like you're enjoying it, right? There should be expressions on our face that say, this is something that's special to me. But by the way, it shouldn't be just up on the platform, should it? And we really shouldn't have to say, Smile, right? It should be something that comes out of us naturally because worship is emotional. Our feelings are affected. Do you allow? Do you allow yourself to feel the presence of God? Some people are afraid that if they do, they might roll in the aisles or do something weird. You know what? If God wants you to roll in the aisle and you're going to worship him, roll away. Okay? <laughs> to love God, he goes on, is to love God with our mind. Our mind. And in this, Jesus is saying that genuine worship is both in spirit and truth. In worship, we're, we're meant to intellectually reach for the truth of God. I, I am, when I'm looking at the word of God and when I'm in worship here, I'm trying to get to know God better, aren't we? And there ought to be this intellectual stimulation that comes from that. We're designed to worship intellectually and, and to ponder the deep mysteries of God. How did he put the universe in space? How does eternity go on forever? And yet God is there and he's here now with us. And I guess the question for this one is, are you listening in worship? Are you listening to what God is saying? Now please note, I did not say, are you listening to Pastor Bill? I said, are you listening to what God is saying? And incidentally, to listen means to act upon what you hear with your ears. So to be intellectually stimulated is actually to be moved to some action, to do something because you've listened to God. And then the fourth one is to love God with all of our strength. And by the way, this points to the physical part of worship, doesn't it? It's reflected in the literal meaning of the primary biblical word for worship. You know what it is? The, the main word for worship is to bow down. There's another word for praise is to actually kiss God. There ought to be this sense in which our bodies are a part of worship. And that's why sometimes, because most of you are shy, 
we'll actually say, please stand and worship God. Our bodies need to get involved in it. We're not meant to be just observers. We're not supposed to be watching the people up here seeing if they can perform well. Their job is just to kind of say, hey, hey, here's, here, here, let me help you in your thoughts. Their job is to prompt us all so that we, the worship team, can worship God. Amen. And that should involve even, look at the posture. What did we do in, in, in prayer earlier? We knelt in prayer. And there are postures that are about our physical part. That's to love God with our whole strength. How many of you stand or at least applaud at a concert? The rest of you don't? <laughs> How many of you have ever been to a sporting event and you clapped, applauded, cheered, made noise? The rest of you don't? <laughs> Folks. If you stand and applaud for human events, then should we be inhibited when we're in the presence of God? Unless you become like a little child, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. I was also thinking, what is it that we worship today? I've been reading through the book of Jeremiah recently and it's troubling how Jeremiah keeps warning them, if you will just repent, God wants to forgive you. And if you'll repent, you won't be punished. And you need to just, all you need to do is stop worshiping these other gods. And they actually come to Jeremiah and they say, Jeremiah, please tell us what's going to happen to us. Are, are we going to be safe? Should we go out and fight this battle? Or should, what should we do? Should we go to Egypt and be safe there? And, and he inquires of the Lord for them. And he says, okay, I'm going to ask God what God says. And you guys got to make sure that you obey whatever God says. And he comes back and he tells them, God said, you're supposed to stay here and not go to Egypt. You're supposed to get rid of the other gods and just worship him and he will protect you. And they said, well, we're not going to do what you just said. Because we believe that the lady from Egypt, the God of Egypt, has been the one who's been feeding us, and we're going to trust her to protect us, and they continue to worship those gods, and they will be destroyed because of it. What do we worship? It's always dangerous to ask people what they worship and then especially to step on their toes when you say that they shouldn't be worshiping that. One of the reasons why people don't like it when pastors talk about money is because sometimes we're talking about their God. What do you worship? Do you worship sport? Do you, do you worship yourself? Calvin, you need to ask your friends, do you worship video games? Do you worship coffee? This is an interesting one, being up front here. It's, it's interesting when, when you're up front here and you watch people who, instead of taking time to be worshiping, are, need their coffee. Well, it, it, is, is that because it's that boring and you need the caffeine to keep you awake? Or is it the caffeine that's most important to us? I know now I might be stepping on a god. <laughs> What do you worship? Because this fact is we are all vulnerable to worshiping other gods. We need to examine and say what might those gods be. So Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. This is one commandment that he's making. Romans 13, 8 to 10 says, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. The commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one rule, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. <clears throat> Stephen Cole talking about this said, people do not see God and they may not read the Bible but they do see and read the lives of Christians. 
They read your home. They read this church. They read you as you interact with others at work or at school. If they see a remarkable otherworldly love in those places, especially if they see love when they would expect retaliation, they see God abiding in you. If they see anger, bitterness, verbal attacks, and hatred, then we are failing to testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Can people around you, you, not your neighbor, can people around you see the unseen God who's living inside of you? And what does God look like to them as they look at you? Ray Steadman said, love is not just a word to write on a plaque and put on your wall. Love is what you do to people that irritate you. When you're upset and angry and hostile and feel like striking back, start with God. Remember his love to you. Remember his forgiving spirit, how he wipes out everything without requiring anything from you. Respond to it and immediately pass it on to the one you are involved with. Love toward God is the most important thing in our life. Jesus is right when he says loving God is top priority. Everything else will flow from that love. But if you put anything else first, the whole process will soon run dry. John MacArthur, talking about the same thing, says those whose lives are not characterized by love for others are not Christians, no matter what they claim. C.S. Lewis in his book, The Four Loves. To love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will be wrung and possibly be broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it carefully around with hobbies and little luxuries Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. The only place outside heaven where you can be perfectly safe from all the dangers of love is hell. And John Piper said, if you don't love your visible brother, then you can't be loving the invisible God. At the end of what Jesus said in response to the question, what's the greatest commandment? The man responds this way, well said, teacher. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. Can I just say that's pretty incredible coming from this lawyer? He's saying, to love God and love your neighbor, that matters more than all the sacrifices, all the burnt offerings, all the things that we say every day that every good Jew's got to do. All that legalism, he says, none of that matters compared to loving God and loving your neighbor. Man, Jesus, you got it. And when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. They knew they were going to lose. The love of God is more important than any legalism. And Jesus, Jesus looking at this man says, you are this close, this close to the kingdom of heaven. You are almost there. This man, I need to say, is not trying to trap Jesus. Notice how it began. He says, this is... I think that's an interesting answer. He's impressed with Jesus. I got a feeling he's been watching Jesus for quite some time. Not just that day. And this, this, Jesus has it right. He noticed that Jesus had given a good answer. And now, because of that answer, Jesus affirms him and says, you are so close to the kingdom of heaven. Does anybody know what happened to that lawyer? We 
We don't know. Could he have been one named Nicodemus who will pay for the tomb? We don't know. Never was named. He was this close, this close to heaven. Oh my, he was even closer than that. Jesus is standing right in front of him. Jesus, the way to heaven, is right there for him. And, and, and this man, start, oh, wow, he's starting to respect him. He's starting to understand something special about him. He's moved by him. He's starting to worship him, folks. You're this close to heaven. On Wednesday, Debbie and I were at Subway. And Dennis Labadee and Rose, his wife, came into Subway. And they're a bit grubby. They'd been up working on some stuff up here. And for those of you who don't know Dennis, he was the editor of the Alpenhorn until he sold it here about two years ago. He got married to Rose Whelan, a lady he'd lived with for 36 years, had a couple of kids. And, and, and he married her because he said he was afraid he was going to die and leave her without any protection. So he finally married her. And I had the privilege of doing that wedding. <laughs> and he joked about the fact that I taught, used the name of Jesus eight times in their wedding ceremony. I <laughs> snuck Jesus in there several times. And, 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 and Dennis also liked to brag about him being, him being a Buddhist and all that. And he said, um, he said, my defibrillator went off this last week. He had a defibrillator placed in his heart recently. Um, he, he had a very, very unhealthy heart. He also had a full reconstruction of his leg. He had a titanium leg, literally. He was, called himself Bionic Man. And they redid, they redid that leg here just within the last two years. And, um, and he said, uh, the doctor said I only have 10% of my heart. You know that one, huh? <laughs> and I said, Dennis? Dennis, it's time for you to get serious about Jesus. Dennis uh, worked on a book about Jesus. And he had his kind of weird view of him, but he worked on this book about Jesus. And after writing that book, he sits down and he says, Bill, he says, um, I'm that close to accepting Jesus and believing in him. Dennis, it's time for you to get serious about Jesus. Dennis, what, you're, you're Buddhist. What, what do you believe about what's going to happen after you die? Well, I'm going to, eventually I'm going to go to nirvana. Dennis, what's nirvana? Well, that's, that's heaven. Yeah, but what's nirvana? That's where you've reached fulfillment to nothing. Time for you to get serious about Jesus. On Friday, Dennis died. He's that close. And I don't know that he committed his life to Christ. Now I gotta tell you, there's a lot of people in this mountain who don't like Dennis. <laughs> he is rude and obnoxious. <laughs> he wrote some nasty things. He tried to upset people. It was his goal. God's called us not just love him, but to love our neighbor. And it should break our heart. if someone doesn't end up in heaven. Father, I don't know what happened to that attorney. I feel like I gave my best shot. Even standing in a subway
trying to get a word in with Dennis who loved to talk. And you know. You know how close he was. And I didn't realize how close he was to death. God, help us to love our neighbors. Lord, I realize that we're not really going to love our neighbor if we don't really love you. So, Lord, I would pray that we would grow in our love for you and love you with our whole heart, our whole mind, our whole soul, and all of our strength. And that that would cause us to so love our neighbor that it would change our world. I don't know how close you are to heaven. But if you haven't said yes to Jesus. Oh, you've gone to church. You've been called yourself a Christian, but... You know you haven't loved him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And I would invite you to confess that to him and to commit yourself to loving him. And also make a commitment today to love your neighbor. So if you need to say yes to Jesus, would you just raise your hand as a statement to him that you're saying yes to Jesus? God, thank you for those who are making that statement. Oh Lord, help us. To love you with everything we have in us. And to let the world see that love in the way we treat them. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.